The Captain Frederick Pabst Mansion at 20th and Wisconsin, built for the Beer Baron in 1890, is among the reasons this street was once called the Grand Avenue. Its architectural style is called German Renaissance Revival. A little to the east at 9th and Wisconsin, you'll find the Wisconsin Club. It was once the mansion of Alexander Mitchell, reputed to be 19th century Wisconsin's richest man. The original residence was remodeled into a French Second Empire-style mansion in the 1870s. This is among the oldest early residences along the avenue, the Sylvester Pettibone House at 21st and Wisconsin, once a farmhouse on 250 acres, has been extensively remodeled. It began as an Italianate structure and dates to 1857. While it's still possible to sample Milwaukee's rich history along the avenue, many of the large homes of our early prosperous pioneers are gone. Also gone from Wisconsin Avenue, the Elizabeth Plankenton Mansion, seen here about 1890. More on this home later. The Marquette University Alumni Union now occupies that site. Brother William Plankenton had a large home just across the street. The mansion next door belonged to their father, meatpacker John Plankenton. They were located on the south side of Wisconsin Avenue, now the Marquette University campus. We're going to take a closer look now at a couple of mansions that have at least in part been salvaged here in the city with my guests, Carlin Hadela and Paul Jakubovich, associate planners with the Milwaukee Department of City Development. And we welcome you to Insight, first of all. Thank Before you. we get to the specifics of those mansions, let's talk a little bit about why so many of them seem to have disappeared in our city. What has happened? Either one of you. Carlin. Well, there were a lot of political and economic factors that contributed to, to their demise. Um, the, over time, uh, the great mansions that lined Wisconsin Avenue, for example, were seen as sort of white elephants. Uh, the well-to-do people moved to trendier neighborhoods up the North Shore, um, left the houses behind, institutions, Marquette University, various hospitals, um, healthcare organizations uh, looked upon these as as uh, buildings that could be used for other purposes but then over time as institutions evolved and developed and grew the original mansions were no longer adequate and they came down for new buildings and um, it's that's that's one of the the processes that took place um, urban renewal was a big factor after World War II uh, where there was a lot of incentive for cities to just sort of like clear-cutting a forest, just clear-cutting entire sections of, of urban areas to make way for new development. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the, the great mansions and interesting houses of pioneers and, and um, uh, the movers and shakers of Milwaukee or other communities as well uh, tended to be in those areas that were targeted for renewal. Well, we do have an interest in, in preserving many of these things now, obviously. And what, what is your role and the role of the Department of City Development and Historic Preservation in, in, uh, in keeping these things in our city? 
Well, ultimately, preserving buildings is really about wanting to keep around the best things that the past uh, generated, the best features of those buildings as well. So we're interested in uh, developing uh, a public awareness of uh, what features and what types of buildings are uh, the most important and usually we don't have a lot of trouble convincing people when we are able to point out some of the really wonderful craftsmanship and the design skills that went into these structures. So often what happened is in the 19th century and early 20th century the styles changed so rapidly that um, the people themselves at that time weren't even appreciative. Uh, every 10 years there was another style and uh, we're finally catching up to all those changes now and trying to understand them. And when we stand back and look at them, we know that there is something of great value and they add great value to the city when they are properly preserved and enhanced. So our role is to preserve, enhance, and uh, if we have to rebuild them every now and then, well, that's part of it too. Some of uh, the, art the architectural artifacts now have been preserved from a couple of mansions in the city, and let's talk about those. Before we talk specifically about what we have, let's talk about what you're trying to do with these, these, uh, art these architectural artifacts that you have. What are we trying to accomplish? Well, our first step was actually assessing what we had, what had been salvaged, um, uh, the, the elements or the, the parts of these mansions had been in storage um, uh, ever since the buildings were demolished. Um, in one case from the late 70s, in another case uh, the early, uh, like 1980. And, um, and just seeing what, what was there and, and what it looked like. And so part of our, um, our mission was to put these pieces back together to see what there was, what was left. And actually there was a, a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of uh, beautiful, um, elements, and we could actually recreate the entire entry hall, for example, of the Elizabeth Plankinton Mansion, mm -hmm. and uh, recreate the uh, the elements from the, the the bamboo bedroom, for example. Um, so we could actually see that there was a lot there, um, and it wasn't just a few bits and pieces or a few doodads that people just saved as mementos, but they actually saved entire room sets. Okay, the Elizabeth Plankton Mansion and the Elan Mansion we're talking about, uh, we're looking for new homes, aren't we, for these things that have been preserved by the city? Yes, now that we've, uh, Carl and I spent uh, some time putting these back together, we can actually see what we have, and now we're in the position to say, well, where might they um, best be relocated? And uh, that uh, is a process that uh, can take a little bit of time. But ultimately, I think in throughout preservation history, salvaging, or out throughout uh, history in general, uh, items from old buildings or, or those that have been demolished or destroyed, um, they have wanted to save them and to reuse them. We see architectural salvage being used in buildings that are well over a thousand years old that are still standing uh, in the world today. Uh, but the basic concept is always to reuse things um, as completely as they were in their original context. So if there was an entire room it would be most desirable to take every bit of that room uh, and place it into a, another structure, a new building or an existing building. Uh, and in a sense, the new structure uh, or different structure should accommodate it so that it really fits like a glove, so it doesn't really stand out. You don't want someone usually saying, oh, well, you brought this here, didn't you? It usually means that maybe it isn't quite a good fit. Uh, Milwaukee's City Hall um, Common Council Chambers contains uh, some um, reinstalled woodwork from the um, uh, E-Line, the Henry E-Line Mansion, and um, it was done in a very good fashion. In fact, most people think that it was always original to the Common Council Chambers, and, um, and it really is something that attracts attention today. It really fits very, very well. Um, and you have to really go out of the way to tell people, well, this wasn't here. This was brought in from, from one of Milwaukee's famous beer baron mansions. Let's talk about the specifics that we have now. Let's start with the, uh, the Elizabeth Plankenton Mansion. Uh, but why is this a significant, why was it a significant building and, and uh, why, who were these people? Let's talk about that first of all. Let's get that, uh, the historic uh, aspect of it here first of all. Elizabeth Plankenton was a member of the Plankenton family. Uh, John Plankenton was, uh, made his money in, in meatpacking, and he was sort of the pioneer meatpacker in the city. 
and also started uh, investing in a lot of real estate, a lot of downtown sites uh, where significant buildings were constructed, um, had all had belonged or maybe still belonged to some of the Plankinton descendants mm -hmm. today. What about the architecture of the building? Uh, the building was designed by Edward Townsend Mix, who was the premier architect of Milwaukee in the 19th century. Um, he had remodeled an existing house for Elizabeth's father, John, um, and uh, on the other opposite side of Wisconsin Avenue, the south side of Wisconsin Avenue. And uh, John had built a house for his son as a wedding present for his son, William, and Mix had designed that house as well, and that was just next door to uh, John's house. And then when it came time when Elizabeth was engaged, um, John decided to um, build a house as a wedding present for his daughter and uh, called on the top architectural firm of the day. And it was a beautiful example of Romanesque revival. It was very high style for its time. And a lot of the interior, especially in the entry hall, shows um, what would have been up-to-date um, influence of the aesthetic movement um, in a lot of the details, uh, incorporating a lot of floral motifs and, and things like that um, into, into the, the design of the woodwork, into uh, decorative features in the house. Now the, the entryway would have included the, the large staircase that, uh, that yes. we have at least portions of, right? Yes, yes. yes. The, the Plankerton was truly a, a, a castle quality mansion. It, it really looked like a castle. It was built like a traditional European castle. And uh, it really stood head and shoulders above many other uh, fine homes in Milwaukee. It really was a focal point. It attracted attention um, well over 100 years ago when it was, when it was pretty new. And, uh, and it still does today. It, it still is a building that lingers in the memories of many Milwaukeeans because it was such a grand structure. And these things that we have uh, were saved because there was the realization that this was a very special place and that perhaps if, if the uh, it, it building had to be demolished, then there could be some way of, of at least uh, uh, capturing and, and, and retaining some of the, the very special qualities that this building uh, has. It really uh, exemplified some of the best craftsmanship that Milwaukee had. Uh, when we were putting these things painstakingly together and we were matching up uh, glue lines and nail holes and that sort of thing, uh, it, it was real obvious that, that every piece was put together uh, with uh, the most demanding care, with the highest quality skills. And uh, it's the type of thing that uh, we don't see a lot of I anymore today because it is so expensive. It's not impossible to get it. It's just that most people are unaware that this kind of craftsmanship exists. One of the great things about retaining it is that we hope that people will want to use this uh, for new structures, the, just the craftsmanship idea that, um, that there were how to put two pieces of wood together in a corner may seem like a very simple thing. But actually there are some tricks to getting it to really come out quite right. The cutting and coping of corners, for example, and the way that was done. Um, these can enhance brand new buildings that have really nothing to do with preservation. The skills we have to retain as well, just as much as we want to retain maybe a building or portions of them. So um, preservation of the structure can really go a long way um, for everyone and not just for people who have an affection for older buildings. Take us on a little tour, if you would, of where the, these things are in storage now and, and you've set them all up. Uh, take us on a little tour, if you would, of, of the various areas. Okay. I, I just want to add, when we were talking about the craftsmanship, uh, on one element of the Plankinton Mansion, we, we found scrawled in chalk Matthews Brothers, and they were the premier uh, woodworking firm, an interior firm in Milwaukee. They were based here, and actually they, they later on went on to design um, all the interior work for Henry Ford's mansion uh, in Dearborn. So they were, they had national reputation, and so it wasn't, it, it would have been typical of John Plankinton to have gotten the best of the best. And there are articles that make reference to the fact that he used local craftspeople, but obviously these were not just your average Joe type craftspeople, these were um, um, nationally renowned um, firms that, that contributed to the interior of the house. 
Now you yeah. have some specific rooms. You have the, the staircase and some specific rooms. So kind of take us to, through those, if you would. Well, the, the core of the house uh, was its grand staircase and entry hall. Uh, it's, uh, the staircase uh, was three stories tall, um, and we have uh, the majority of that actual staircase, the railings and uh, the wainscoting and uh, all the other fine trimmings that went along with it. Uh, we have it set up now so that um, as you walk in um, to in front of the staircase, it would be basically what you would have seen um, more than 115 years ago. You see uh, the walls that surrounded, the wooden walls that surrounded this staircase, um, and uh, it, it's even illuminated with uh, an 1880s chandelier and so forth, and it um, does give you immediately an idea of what it was like walking into the, to the front uh, foyer uh, of this grand house. Um, so off of that staircase hall on the first floor were located a, um, a dining room, um, a front parlor, and a rear parlor, and we have portions of those. And um, on the second floor, as you exited off the staircase, there were some very interesting rooms that um, uh, we w worked on putting together, uh, such as the bamboo room, and, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's a wonderful room that it looks as though it's made all out of bamboo with a bamboo-like fireplace, but actually it's made out of birch, and uh, made by Matthews Brothers, we believe, the premier mm -hmm. uh, furniture maker in Milwaukee. Um, and we also have some bedrooms and a library and so forth. And um, this uh, collection really does um, give a very, very good representation of, of a very, very grand home. It's very unusual, too, to see a collection like this together. Um, usually when buildings are demolished, uh, things maybe don't even make it that far. They're, they're split up. and So uh, it, it's, it, it is a very um, uh, interesting and, and, and important collection of things, and it's uh, uh, really remarkable that they're, that they're all still there and uh, waiting to be reused. And it's, it's kind of interesting, too, that uh, uh, Paul can go more in depth about the rifts on white oak. Uh, that's just phenomenal in the entry hall. The quality of the woodwork, the grain in the wood is just, just fantastic. And you go into the different, um, the different rooms were given different themes, and that would have been typical of any mansion of its era. But um, the rear parlor, for example, is gorgeous mahogany. Um, and the decorative themes, their, their thematic details are incorporated into all the little elements of that room. Um, there's sort of Moorish arches that, that um, frame the walls in the, the, the floor. There were, there were, it was absolutely a phenomenal paneled ceiling um, that would incorporate squares that, that featured birds in flight. And, um, other creatures like that that were in keeping with that aesthetic movement theme um, that was, was incorporated into the house. Plank and Dimension, not the only uh, architectural artifact that we're talking about today, the other being the, from the E-Line home. Let's tell me a little bit about the E-Line home. It wasn't on the avenue, it was over on Galena. Right. It was uh, basically in the general area that's referred to as Brewer's Hill because the E-Lines were the owners of the Schlitz Brewing Company. And there were a number of Eline brothers who, um, um, or cousins, I'm not sure of all the family relationships, but uh, um, they were in charge of, uh, of uh, that brewing company. And it was just sort of a stone's throw from work. And that would have been very typical of the time period for the, the business owner to be within walking distance of his manufacturing plant or his shop or whatever. And uh, yeah, the house was actually located at uh, 437 West Galena Street, an area that's been completely redeveloped today. What has been warehousing. salvaged now from that building? Largely, we have the um, central staircase hall and the, stair and the staircase uh, uh, from the first to the second story. And uh, part of the staircase hall, as I talked about earlier, has already been reinstalled. Uh, it was reinstalled many years ago. In the Milwaukee uh, Common Council, there's a little anteroom in the uh, Common Council, off the Common Council chambers, and that is now completely ornamented with the wainscoting and some chandeliers um, and uh, some other important uh, cabinetry items that came uh, from that house. Um, we have the staircase more or less uh, intact. We have the majority of it, and it still is um, 
uh, very valuable in and of itself. Uh, so the things that have been removed uh, and replaced already uh, do not necessarily diminish the, the value of, of this wonderful staircase. Um, it's, not as, uh, it's not as large, it was not as large a house as the uh, Plankenton Mansion um, and uh, has a even different, it's a different type of oak, um, but uh, it, it does really show that um, type of golden oak, um, very uh, meticulously crafted staircase that we really associate with the 19th century. Really, a, a, you know, the great idea of grandma's house or great grandma's house, it really um, has a, it, you relate to it in a very different way than the Plankington. Um, they're both beautiful in their own right. One obviously much more costly than the other when they were new, but they both impress people um, today um, and in different ways. So it's kind of a remarkable contrast. Uh, one built for the heiress of a, of a packing company and the other built um, by, a, by a, a beer baron. Um, and they really do paint a very interesting picture of, of uh, the lifestyles of Milwaukeeans um, in the 1880s. Are there other buildings around uh, the city, uh, the area that uh, the two of you would like to see preserved in this way, at least parts of them? Let's, and let's talk about the importance mm -hmm. of, of having people understand mm -hmm. the, the necessity or the importance of preserving these things. Well, well we, we certainly, uh, we've lost, we have lost yes. a tremendous number of our buildings over the years due to, you know, social changes and changes in tastes. Changes in tastes were probably one of the biggest reasons that we probably lost a lot of them. They, they probably weren't, some mansions weren't kept up or just even ordinary homes weren't kept up as well because people tended to think, well, maybe there's no value in them. But um, what, we're, what we're really seeing is that many of these structures today um, are very valuable, even for the, very, the boards that were used to make them, uh, the, the two by fours and two by sixes in the walls. Um, there are extensive salvage operations now throughout the country that, that uh, go out and try to salvage all the boards uh, in an older home because they, the, the quality of that basic construction lumber is better than anything that we get today and in, in, uh, that we take from our forests uh, today. So we have uh, in Milwaukee a very large area of, of older homes. And I think it's fair to say that throughout Milwaukee, we had a very high level of craftsmanship here, even for uh, homes that were not anywhere near a mansion quality, uh, but they um, uh, still have a, a, a tremendous amount of value. And uh, I think it would be the goal of, of um, of, of preservation in general to to want to make sure that we uh, enhance these homes uh, in or we give people the tools necessary so they can really enhance them and really bring back uh, uh, what we know that they once had uh, in Milwaukee uh, the Wisconsin Avenue corridor Prospect Avenue corridor these areas were Milwaukee's like two of Milwaukee's finest streets let's say in 1885 or so um, we have a few homes left on Wisconsin Avenue, the Paps Mansion, of course, which everyone is familiar with, and the great uh, Harnischweger Mansion at 35th in Wisconsin, German-style home. Um, and we have uh, some great mansions off of Prospect Avenue yet. Um, but we'd have a lot of new homes and, and new developments in between those structures, and um, we don't quite get the picture of the grandeur that these streets once had. So perhaps in many ways we, we want to save as many of the old uh, buildings as we possibly can that are of mansion quality, but we also have um, the um, the homes, the other homes that surrounded these these grand neighborhoods that are very much worthwhile to preserve. And um, I think that Milwaukee in general uh, has such a high degree of wooden craftsmanship. We're talking about the wood that we have in this warehouse, by the way. And this wood is something that was used to build Milwaukee. And one thinks of San Francisco perhaps as the ultimate city of wood, beautifully painted and, and so forth. But Milwaukee really has the potential to look uh, uh, just as good, if not better, because of the high level of craftsmanship that's really being hidden in many ways by um, a lot of siding materials and so forth. And, uh, and it is possible to bring that back. And one of the things I think preservation needs to do is to uh, really come up with cost-effective means to restore these homes, because um, that is something that is an issue for all of us. To, we just don't want to pour money into things just to make it look good. We want, we want to make it cost effective. It has to really be something that, that, that's affordable. And I think that there's been uh, progress made in that area too. So um, we're certainly hopeful that, that Milwaukee is going to um, continue to um, 
appreciate its, its older buildings and it's going to appreciate a greater um, volume of its older architecture uh, and that these mansions just are kind of the tip of the iceberg and get those and take a look at those but what's and again, around we it. just have a little bit of time left, and Carla, maybe you could just point out again that what you're doing here is looking for a home for these artifacts that we do have now. That's right. Uh, the The artifacts don't don't do anyone any good sitting closed up in a warehouse or being dismantled and under tarps. Um, the beauty of of these features are the, the characteristics of the wood, the the craftsmanship, and how these were put together. I mean, I've learned. I've learned so much about about wood just in the time I worked uh, with the artifacts, and um, but having them where they can be enjoyed by the public, um, some kind of a forum where they can be um, put in context, and um, uh, the rooms are set up not again as just little piecemeal strips of decorative features, you know, displayed on a wall, but actually sort of recreate. The sense of what it was to be in these rooms and to enjoy the rooms. I think that's that's really an important. All right. important well, thing. We thank you very much for our conversation on thank these you. items today. It's